In 1989, the initial Indiana Jones trilogy of movies, created by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, was coming to an end with the final installment, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. The film, set in 1938, sees the swashbuckling fictional archaeologist Dr. Henry Indiana Jones Jr. race against a band of Nazis in the hunt for the legendary Cup of Christ, the Holy Grail. The film includes an elaborate chase scene featuring a tank owned by the fictional Sultan of Hatay, the ruler of a republic located somewhere in the region of Turkey. In appearance, it is similar to that of the real-world tank Mark VIII Liberty. While portrayed in the movie as a real tank operated by the army of the Republic of Hatay, with great similarity to a World War I tank, it is, however, a completely fictional vehicle. Officially, this tank was never named. It is often just referred to as the Indiana Jones tank or the Last Crusade tank. For the purpose of this article, the vehicle will be identified as the Hatay Heavy Tank, based on its country of origin and appearance. Welcome to a new Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. Before we continue, an important mention. This is a fictional vehicle, not a fake one. The main difference between fake and fictional lies in one very important element, deceit. A fake tank is a vehicle that never existed historically, but that is claimed to have been real. A fictional vehicle, which also did not exist historically, makes no such attempt at fooling the unknowledgeable. Also, we would like to thank all of our patrons for their support. This time, we would like to thank Alex de Moya, who is one of our oldest and most generous patrons. Thank you, Alex. You make this happen. This heavy tank is vaguely reminiscent of the tank Mark VIII International Liberty. The Mark VIII appeared in 1918 and was the most modern iteration of the quasi-rhomboid-shaped tank design made successful by the British in 1916, starting with the tank Mark I. The Mark VIII was a joint project between Britain and the United States, with plans to construct the vehicles in France, hence the name International Liberty, often shortened to just Liberty. The idea of the joint project was to give both nations a common tank for their respective armies. In total, 125 Mark VIII tanks were built, but they entered service too late to see action in World War I. Where the Hatay tank differs is the presence of a large Churchill-esque turret mounted atop the vehicle, instead of the small superstructure present on the real Mark VIII. It is unclear whether this is supposed to be a modification made by the fictional country, or whether it is supposed to be an original feature. In reality, no British production tank of World War I era was equipped with a turret like this, and armament was primarily carried in sponsons projecting from the flanks of the vehicle. The first turreted British tank to enter service did not, in fact, appear until 1924, in the shape of the Vickers Medium Mark I. Reminiscent of the Mark VIII, the Hatay Heavy Tank is quasi-rhomboidal in shape and around 11 meters long, weighing 25 tons. These statistics are not too far off from the Mark VIII's length and weight, at 10.42 meters and 37 tons respectively. The vehicle's tracks, as is typical with British heavy tanks of World War I, travel around the entirety of the hull. There are rollers hidden by the side plating at the bottom of the track run. No springing system of suspension was used, but, given the low speed of the vehicle, just 8 to 10 km per hour for the Mark VIII, it was not necessary either. Despite the vehicle's similarities to the Mark VIII, the forward track sections are slightly different. On the real Mark VIII, the forward track sections revolve over a large curve. On this Hatay heavy tank, the track sections are much more sharply angled, more like the early British Mark I to V tanks. Despite the size of the tank, it would appear to be operated by just a four-man crew. Despite the real Mark VIII, which needed a crew of 10 to 12 men. 
However, there does seem to be room inside the Hatai tank for 8 to 10 people standing fully upright. There also appears to be ample room for a four man fist fight. The crew consists of the driver located front and center of the hull, who controls the tank via the traditional method of two tiller bars. His primary vision is via a suicidally large hole, for want of a better word, in the front of the tank. This hole is at least 15 centimeters in height and 30 centimeters wide, and would offer no protection to him at all in a battle situation. It does appear to be part of a larger hatch that opens out and down. This is probably his main point of entry. The vehicle requires two gunners, one for each sponson gun. They would aim, load and fire the weapon themselves. The last member of the crew is an overworked commander positioned in the turret. He appears to be responsible for loading and firing the turret's gun, as well as commanding the tank. The engine of the tank is located in the large tail. It is of an unknown type and the speed of the vehicle is unknown. It is, however, certainly faster than the 8 to 10 km per hour of the Mark 8. For armament, the tank is equipped with two sponson mounted cannons. These are presumably Hotchkiss 6 pounder guns, as would be found on the real Mark 8. These guns were operated a bit like giant rifles and were aimed completely by hand, without gears, and fired via a pistol grip. On the Hatai tank, these were augmented by the addition of a fully rotatable turret on the roof of the vehicle. This is a one-man turret, visually similar to the turret of a Mark III Churchill, albeit much smaller and predating it by about five years. Mounting an unknown gun, identified simply as a six-pound gun by Indiana Jones when first laying eyes on the vehicle. This turret does not seem to have a basket, but there is a platform suspended from the roof underneath it for the commander to stand on. This platform does not appear to rotate with the turret. The commander's primary vision from the turret is a large slit in the turret face on the left of the gun. This appears to be part of a larger port that can swing up and open, but the gun seems to lack an accurate sight of any description, be it periscopic or telescopic. There is a large circular hatch in the turret roof that opens up and back, but this has no vision devices. The tank is completely devoid of any machine gun armament, which would have been far more useful for shooting someone on horseback in the movie than the six-pounder. On the real Mark VIII, machine guns would be found in ball mounts in the large access hatches behind the sponsons and in the roof superstructure. Even without machine guns, a large amount of small arms ammunition cans do appear to be carried. Of course, fitted with machine guns, poor Indiana would have been gunned down much more quickly, so perhaps omitting them was a convenience for the movie rather than anything attempting to mirror historical reality. The only periscope present on the tank would be more at home, on a submarine. It is a literal periscope located behind a turret. It is manually pushed up from inside the tank and is capable of 360 degree rotation. The periscope is completely useless in this position as forward vision would be blocked by the turret. Also, raising the periscope would be impossible if the turret was traversed to the rear as the main guard barrel would collide with the scope. There is a reason these devices are not found on tanks, and quite why this was added to the movie is unclear, as its sole purpose seems to be to provide an attempt at humor when Indiana kicks it, sending the control handle spinning into the back of the operator's head. The exterior of the tank is almost completely covered with the storage of auxiliary equipment. Torpolins, shovels, netting, reels of cable, unditching beams, bundles of other sundries, and even spools of barbed wire are carried. While many real-world tanks carry a mix of such equipment, excluding the barbed wire, the sheer amount present on the Hatai tank is absurd. The tracks bear no resemblance to the tracks used on the Mark 8 or any British tank of the First World War or interwar period. 
they are more akin to industrial excavator tracks. Not a surprise given that the vehicle the tank was built on for the movie is exactly that. World War I British tank tracks, like those used on the Mark 8, were deceptively simple, consisting of a frame on the back of the track link for the driving gear to engage, with the plate bolted to the front for contact with the ground. The links were pinned together through this frame, with bulges on one side to accommodate the curve of the track. For the filming of the movie, which took place between May and September 1988, the tank was designed and built by special effects artist George Gibbs, who took inspiration from the real tanks of the First World War. The Tank Museum Bovington in the UK allowed measurements of their Mark 8 to be taken. As a thank you, the production team gave Bovington one of the Nazi Eagle standards from the first Indiana Jones film, Raiders of the Lost Ark. This now resides in the museum's artifacts archive. Both director Steven Spielberg and writer George Lucas wanted the tank to look as real as possible. As a result, Gibbs decided to build a full-scale working prop. It was built using parts of a 25-ton excavator, especially the tracks, which weighed 6.3 tons alone. The vehicle was built almost completely out of steel instead of the usual lighter materials such as plastic, wood or fiberglass. The idea was that it would enhance the visual appearance of the tank, but also to make the prop tough enough to survive the violent terrain that its scenes were shot in. This terrain was a canyon in Almeria, in the south of Spain. In the words of Gibbs himself, World War I tanks did not have suspension, so we built ours without suspension also. Because of that, I knew the vibration inside the tank would be absolutely tremendous and would shake a mock-up vehicle to pieces. For that reason, I decided to build the tank from steel. Also, if any of it ever broke apart, we could quickly weld it back together. As it turned out, the tank went down the sides of mountains and over really hard, rocky surfaces without any damage at all, and I knew then that I had made the right decision. The vehicle was propelled by two Range Rover V8 petrol engines, connected to two hydraulic pumps, one per track unit. A motor from a bulldozer was also installed to provide electrical power. All three of the guns were real, and all of them fired blank charges. It took Gibbs and his team four months to build the tank. It was flown to Almeria aboard a short Belfast heavy freight aircraft. To transport the vehicle to location, it was loaded onto a heavy transport truck. According to Gibbs, We were lucky, shooting went smoothly, and the tank only let us down twice. The first time was because the rotor arm in the distributor broke, and it took us a day to get a new one from Madrid. The second time, it was so hot that the solder in the oil coolers actually melted and flowed around with the oil into the valves, shattering two of them to pieces. So we had to change one of the engines, and that also took one day. I think everyone expected to lose a lot more time, but the tank worked really well. The only real part of the interior was the driver's seat. The rest of the interior scenes were filmed in a studio. The tank was driven in the film by special effects technician Brian Lintz. Brian did an excellent job. Being in the tank was like being in an oven, and he was in there every day for nearly eight weeks. We had ten industrial electric fans inside to try and keep Brian cool, the engine cool, and the hydraulic oil cool. Not only was it hot in there, but since the tank had no suspension, Brian got rattled around so much that when he came out and tried to take a cup of tea, he would spill it before he could get it to his lips. To safely accommodate the filming of the elaborate fight scenes that took place atop the vehicle, Gibbs duplicated the upper half of the tank to identical detail, complete with rotating tracks, and mounted it on a large four-wheel trailer, reportedly an ex-army searchlight trailer. Alone, this semi-tank weighed around 7.2 tons. 
Unlike the full tank, it was made from aluminum, and the tracks were made of rubber so stunts could be performed safely. Catches were also installed around the vehicle to catch anyone that fell off, on purpose or accidentally. In total, it took 10 days to film 10 minutes worth of tank scenes at a total cost of $200,000 a day. For some of the long-range shots and the scene where the tank drives off the cliff, a smaller-scale remote control model was constructed. It was an exact replica of the full-size vehicle down to the smallest detail. This model was about 1.83 meters long and 60 centimeters high. It is unknown what happened to the tank in the years directly after filming. However, for a number of years, it simply sat rotting in the boneyard of Hollywood Studios, an area full of forgotten movie props. After some time, it was moved to Disney's Hollywood Studios at the Walt Disney World Resort in Florida and put on public display. It was not repainted or restored, however, and left in poor condition. Sometime later, in around 2010-2011, the vehicle was repainted in plain desert tan scheme and placed in a mock scene with prop World War II German equipment, complete with MG-34 machine gun nest. This is how it remained until around 2015 or 2016, when the vehicle was completely overhauled and repainted back to its movie appearance, complete with Hatai markings, with a large set built around it, again with German army-themed props. This is how the vehicle continues to sit today. This was all for this video. Make sure to follow and subscribe, and also check out our website. We'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. If you use Discord, there's a link to our community server in the description. And if you would like to help us continue to develop and expand, consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us improve and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.